Uh, welcome to the penultimate in our Bringing Vikings Back to the East Midlands lecture series. Uh, today I'm happy to welcome Dr. Sue Brunning from the British Museum. I shall begin first by saying, Midlands Viking Symposium, if you want more Vikings in your life after the lecture series is finished, on the 28th of April here at Nottingham we shall have the Midlands Viking Symposium and you should all have had a flyer and if you don't you can grab one on the way out. So today's speaker is Dr. Sue Brunning. Sue is curator of the British Museum's European Early Medieval Collections in the Department of Britain, Europe and Prehistory. She tells me that she basically has responsibility for everything but the Vikings there. <laughs> uh, she's currently working on a monograph based on her PhD about swords in Northern Europe. And she's also writing up the Beedale Sword Hilt, the subject of today's lecture, for publication in the British Museum's forthcoming book about the Vale of York Horde, which will also include other more recently discovered hordes. So I think that one's going to be worth looking out for. So I'll pass you over to Sue Brunning. Thank you very much and thank you also to the organisers of this spectacular series, it's been fantastic um, for inviting me to join in the fun, so uh, it's really lovely for me to be here today and to see such a full room with everybody engaged with early medieval archaeology which is just top notch, so welcome everybody. So um, yeah, I'm delighted to be part of this, this programme for this kind of festival of, of Vikings that, that's happening in, in Nottingham at the moment. It's, it's really good fun. And of course, there's the exhibition over the way that's developed um, in association with York Museums Trust and the British Museum, which is obviously where I work. And over there, one of the star attractions is um, the Beedale Horde. There's the location of uh, where the Horde was discovered in 2012 by metal detectorists and where we are today in Nottingham. Some of you may remember when this was uh, in the news, it made quite a big splash in the news uh, at the time that it was discovered and Yorkshire Museum launched a fundraising campaign to acquire the treasure, um, which they did in 2014. The hoard was probably buried in the late 9th to early 10th centuries. It contains um, a group of silver ingots, complete and cut up neck and arm rings, what we refer to as hack silver, and also parts of a sword, which you can see circled there. Now, ingots and pieces of jewellery that have been cut up are quite typical in Viking period hoards from Britain, but the presence of a sword is unique. Now, the sword fittings themselves are almost unique, uh, being an incredibly rare example of this time of a sword that has gold decorations attached to it. So what is this particular sword doing in this particular hoard? Now my talk today uh, will share my progress in researching the Beedale sword fittings for publication, um, as has already been mentioned. So I'm going to describe the pieces, contextualise them a little bit, and propose some interpretations um, for their inclusion in the hoard. I'm also going to talk a little bit about what I think the sword might tell us about um, value, uh, the, the value in the broadest sense of swords in early medieval Britain, a little bit more towards the end. The Beedale sword fittings include an iron pommel, iron upper and lower guards, four gold grip mounts in the form of, of rings in the middle there, and six gold rivets that are probably associated um, with the sword uh, itself. And all of these parts come from the hilt or the handle of the sword, which is the part that's held in the hand. There was no blade discovered in the hoard, so it seems likely that the hilt was removed uh, for deposition and the blade went off somewhere else, uh, but that's another story that, that I won't be delving into today. Mineral preserved textiles and wood uh, were adhering to the surface of the hilt fittings, which seemed to suggest that they were wrapped carefully in cloth before being placed perhaps in a box along with the rest of the hoard and then everything buried in the ground. The pommel is of this particular shape that we often refer to as tri-lobed. Uh, that basically means it has these kind of three knobs, as you can see quite clearly here, and a rather nice curved base. As you can see, it's decorated extensively with thin gold foils in, in a, a sort of arrangements around on top of the surface of the pommel there. And the design on both sides of the pommel appears to be the same, although as you've seen with the um, previous slide, that's kind of slightly obscured, but it looks like it conforms to the same layout, so perhaps a symmetrical design on both sides. <laughs> 
The design centers around a disc in the middle here, which you can see, and that contains a rather acrobatic um, animal in the late Anglo-Saxon Truiddle style, which I'll come back to a little bit later on. That's the roundel there, just in case. Um, the rest of the pommel is decorated with plant stems and leafy motifs in these differently shaped panels and, and little applique shapes there. Um, a few of them just pointed out for you there that you can see these leafy shapes and plant sort of tendrils. The lower edge of the pommel is sheathed in a gold sheet and that's containing interlacing animals a lot like the one that we see in the central disc um, in the middle of the pommel. The curved upper guard is decorated with very similar motifs that we see elsewhere on the rest of the pommel here. And these are arranged in gold foils that create this kind of um, uh, rectangular motif that, that's made up from a lozenge in the middle and then these four triangles on the outside, so kind of like an exploded sort of lozenge um, rectangular motif there. Even the underside of the pommel and the guard is decorated, again with these leafy plant-like stems, just like we've seen on the rest of the pommel. Now the lower guard was probably also decorated in this way with these applied gold foils, but it's very highly corroded and encrusted again with these mineralized materials, so we can't really see. You can just see sort of like little areas where there might be pieces of gold foil poking out from underneath. The four gold rings that were found associated with the hilt are probably from the hand grip, so they're probably the part from directly underneath where the hand is holding. We also see here on the slide the six very tiny gold rivets, which may have fixed additional foils perhaps to that hand grip around where the rings were encircling, and the hand grip was probably made of some kind of organic material like um, bone or antler or horn, which is quite typical for swords of this period. Now the overall shape of the hilt, this quite distinctive shape with the sort of lobed top and the curved guards, this is quite, uh, quite familiar to us and it's categorised under a title that we refer to quite glamorously as Peterson's Type L, uh, which is named after the Norwegian um, uh, archaeologist who categorised uh, swords from this period that were discovered in Norway. And uh, this particular type is known for having these three lobes on the pommel and these curved guards. Now, Peterson type L swords are often decorated with silver foils or plating, like the ones that you can see on this slide. I know they're black and white, so they obviously do look like silver, but you can take my word for it. All of those sort of metallic um, decorations that you can see on these swords are silver rather than gold. Now, many of these swords also have a series of grip mounts. So that's what I was referring to as the part that's being held in the hand. You can see the rings um, in the middle between the, the lower guard and the pommel on these examples here. And these are often decorated in the same way to match the other fittings um, on the rest of the parts of the hilt. Usually, we find two of these mounts. Some of these swords have three, and occasionally there are more. So the sword from Gilling West, which I believe is also over in the exhibition at the moment, has five of these mounts. Now the decoration on these swords, when they are decorated, is usually in the Anglo-Saxon Truiddle style, which is uh, a name that we give to a particular style that we find at this period, which is distinguished by quite, um, quite characteristic panels of plant ornaments, animal ornaments, geometric ornaments, uh, arranged in these little panels. And uh, this particular style dominated Anglo-Saxon art during the 9th century and into the early 10th century and in parts of northern England. So this kind of stylistic dating, according um, to uh, what we can see that's decorating the particular sword, along with the archaeological contexts of uh, the type of sword, these Peterson type L swords, has dated the type of, of sword overall to the mid-9th to 10th centuries. And uh, it also supports a somewhat prevailing view that, that's, that's being questioned a little bit more now, but this sort of overall view that these types of swords are probably Anglo-Saxon in origin. And the dating of the swords also correlates quite well with when we think the Beedale Hoard itself was uh, deposited in the ground. So, nearly, I'm not expecting you to read all of the small print, this is just a kind of example. Um, there are uh, quite a large number of these swords. Now, when I drew up this slide, there were around sort of 70, but I've since uh, discovered an article written in Norwegian that's, that adds a few more to the, to the back. So this is slightly out of date, but there are a good number of these swords probably around the 100 mark. 
um, that we know of to date. Now, this excludes several um, stray finds of pommels and, and fragments of guards that have been recorded on the Portable Antiquities Scheme database. So I'm focusing more on, on the complete source that we have from, from archaeological context here, but there might be a few more represented on the PAS database. Most, as you might be able to see, do come from Britain, with significant numbers also from Norway, and rather fewer from Sweden and Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Germany, Belgium, and the Netherlands. So this is the overall context to which the Beedale sword fittings belong. They also have um, several quite interesting typological, stylistic, and kind of regional um, features that make them also stand out a little bit from the rest of the pack um, of these types of swords. I'm not going to be able to linger on those issues today just because we're, um, we've got a sort of short amount of time, but I would like to take just a few moments to talk about one or two of them because I think they're quite interesting. But if you are interested in learning more detail about that, then uh, this will be discussed further in the publication, so you can have a look there if you'd like to follow up. So first of all, I want to talk a bit about the decoration on the fittings. Now, as I've mentioned, it's clearly in this tradition of the Truidal style, but it's also idiosyncratic in a couple of um, uh, interesting ways. So I'm going to take the animal motifs rather than the plant motifs uh, as a case study here, just because I think that early medieval animals are always really fun to look at. They're always very energetic and lively, and it seems that the maker quite enjoyed working with them too, as we'll see. So first of all, uh, we'll take a closer look at the round or, or the disc in the center of the pommel there. So can everybody see an animal in this, uh, in this roundel? It's a little bit difficult to see. Um, the trick with an Anglo-Saxon animal art is often to try and find the extremities of the creature first. So you can look for the, the, the nose, the snout. The eye is often a good one to look for because it's often just a little drilled hole or kind of like an almond shape or something like that. That's often quite good to find. Or sometimes the tail and the feet, you can find those. And then once you've got those extremities, you can kind of work your way through the rest of the animal and try and find it there. And this particular animal is really hard to unravel because it's, it's somewhat of a contortionist. It took me quite a long time with a, a few highlighter pens to actually uh, discover exactly what he was doing in here. Uh, but we're going to have a little look together so you'll now be able to see the wonders of my uh, craft with Microsoft Paint um, in order to decode our creature here. So first of all, good, that's working. We have the creature's head. You can see that it has a rather blunt snout with a, a, a quite nice little peak nose and again that drilled eye. That's quite clear to see there and that helps you to find, uh, find the head of the creature. And it has a very interesting, um, well, you'll see why it's interesting in a little while, triangle shape be behind the eye there which is probably representing the ear pointing backwards. So it has a slender neck, which kind of follows the lower edge of the disc before dividing into the creature's body and foreleg. If we follow the foreleg, it's a very thin, elongated foreleg, which is extending from a kind of a rounded hip, sort of like a pear-shaped hip there, and it weaves through the creature's own body, tail, and hind leg uh, into the disc center, and then reaches the upper left edge, as you can see it here, to kind of terminate right in front of the creature's jaw there. Next, the body. This is tapering from quite a deep chest, a deep breast, which is arching upwards through the disc center and then down back again towards the right edge as you're looking at it, where it splits into another one of these broad hips um, and uh, a thin tail. So here we have the tail, which is lacing back again towards the left from the hip, and it passes under and over the beast's body in a kind of loop before it ends in what we refer to as kind of like a, ne a nicked or a notched um, uh, point at the lower right edge down there. And last but not least, the hind leg. It's extending kind of diagonally back downwards through the, the, bodies of the, the body of the creature here, passing over it and under the tail um, to terminate in a curled foot that's just nestling under the, the, the sort of neck, the, the snout of the creature there, under the jaws there, just kind of curling back on itself rather nicely, sort of wedged in there. So the snubbed snout and that sort of nicked or notched body and the backward-looking stance of the creature and its interlacing limbs, all of these things um, fit quite comfortably within the Truidal style, uh, which I've been talking about. But I just want to talk um, a little bit more about that notch, which is representing the animal's ear uh, just behind its eye there. 
So the same kind of feature is sported by other beasts on the grip mounts of the sword. So it shows that the hilt pieces do seem to be matching with each other, as I've mentioned, and that they were probably all made to be on the same weapon, which is not always a given for early medieval swords, but that's a completely other story, so I'll just park that one there for now. But um, usually, triwiddle style beasts, as you can see on these strap ends on the left-hand side of the slide there, they have quite smooth heads. Sometimes they're earless, or they might have little rounded or pointed ears, which are kind of poking out of that rather smooth head. But the Beedale uh, beast's ear, as you can see, is quite different. It's like this little sunken triangle uh, set behind the eye there. And I found this to be quite hard to parallel. I, I haven't been able to find um, anything that looks quite like this. And it's possible that this little detail might represent an innovation, a stylistic innovation on the part of the maker of this, uh, this design. Let's look also briefly at the animals around the band at the base of the pommel. So this part just along here. Now the Truidal style, as I've mentioned, it usually puts its animals in little arched frames or little rectangles, kind of these little sort of arcades. And the animals fill the space almost like they're in some kind of little zoo. You know, they have their own little space there. But on the Beedale pommel, as I hope you can see on the slide here, they're allowed to extend much more freely through much longer panels. They have this kind of sinuous space that they can kind of weave their way through. Um, and this rare arrangement, again, I found quite difficult to parallel. The main one that I found is um, on, a, on another sword from the river Wusser at uh, Musa at Wessem in the Netherlands, which I hope you can see is sort of similar uh, bands along the, the lower part of the pommel here, which has these creatures kind of free to move throughout the whole of the space there. <clears throat> now, what this might say about the sword and where it was made is sort of quite difficult to answer, but I will be speaking a bit more about that in the, um, in the publication, so there'll be a little bit more information uh, available. But for now, I just wanted to illustrate that the Beedale Horde is this really interesting mixture of um, quite typical in the form. We find these good parallels for the shape of the, of the actual sword hilt there. But even down at a micro level, it has these little idiosyncrasies, these little unusual elements, these really interesting little different features that sets it apart from, from the sort of other swords in the corpus of these Peterson type L weapons. So I'll just take a quick drink. So now I want to move on to the main focus of my paper, and that's what I think are the most curious, the most interesting aspects of these sword fittings. First of all, the use of gold instead of silver, which I've alluded to um, already in their decoration, but also their very presence in one of these hordes. I think that the two of those things are actually directly related um, to each other, and I think it's here that hopefully the title of my, um, of my talk today will start to become a little bit clearer. But I'm going to take the second one of those things first. So what is this particular uh, weapon, this particular pieces of a sword, doing in one of these hordes? Now, the epic poem Beowulf, which I'm sure is known to all of you, I'm sure we read it all every weekend and we quote it all at length, I know that I do in my daily life. Um, this this uh, poem survives in a manuscript of around 1,000, but probably contains older elements that date back um, to much earlier than that. This, um, this poem refers to swords inside hordes in a couple of different contexts. So one of those is in the, the sort of assemblage of, of material that is in the, 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 the lair of Grendel, the monster's mother, uh, under the mere. And the other one is in the dragon's horde, which you can see is a nice picture of here. You can see an actual sword in there, sort of matching what we find in the poem. So we do find in this poem um, a couple of instances where swords are buried inside hordes. There's also a rather interesting um, illuminated uh, manuscript, this illustration from illuminated manuscript from the 11th century, uh, which shows a horde that's being used by Satan, and you can kind of see his clawed foot down here um, to tempt Christ with his not clawed foot over there. And uh, one of the elements of this horde is a sword. You can see that there, um, a different type of sword, not one of these Peterson type L swords, but still has one of these curved guards, it's a later type. There's also, which caught my eye, this rather weird object up here, which I wanted to be a, one of these pommels. Ah, so, oh, it's like a Beedell pommel inside this hood. But as you can see, it rather has a, a slightly outsized um, uh, proportion compared to the other things, which have a sort of more regular looking proportions, including these really nice 
twisted neck and arm rings, which are just like the types of twisted neck and arm rings that we find in these horns, just like them, the ones in, that we find archaeologically, so it's rather nice. So I think, sadly, it's, it's probably not one of those pommels. It's, it's something else that, that's a little bit difficult to identify. So these references that we have to swords in hordes, in the poetry, in the imagery here, these actually come from kind of quite heightened scenarios, so epic poetry and, and the Bible there. Um, they didn't seem to have a foundation in contemporary practices in late Anglo-Saxon England because despite the significant number of hordes and the growing number of hordes that we have from the period, none of these so far have contained a, a sword. As we've seen instead, these hordes tend to look a bit like this. There we go. So there's a few selection of these, these hordes for you there. So we have coins, we have ingots, we have hack silver that's made up from these neck and arm rings, from brooches and from other items. Mostly, and I say mostly, not exclusively, but mostly um, in silver. Now, some more recent hordes have kind of increased the diversity profile of, of some of these hordes. So, for example, the Vale of York horde uh, had a gold arm ring. Uh, there are other gold pieces have been found in previous hordes, but that's a very nice example of a, of a gold piece in that particular horde. And, of course, the Galloway horde, which was found very recently, very big in the press, you've probably seen. has just whole loads of weird things inside there, lots of, lots of many different things, but again, that really is another story, so uh, we, can't, we can't go into that sadly, but it, it has it's much more unusual content in that hoard. But interestingly and crucially for our purposes here today, none of those seem to contain a piece of a sword. There was a bit of a false alarm uh, a few years ago when pieces of a sword were found in a large assemblage from a riverine site near York, which was publicised at the time as the Ainsbrook Hoard. Uh, you may remember there was a Time Team special about it as well. Uh, but this assemblage is now understood to be a, a Viking winter encampment, most probably, so this sword can be counted out as a potential sword in a hoard. Now, the Staffordshire hoard, of course, showed dramatically that sword fittings might be hoarded in the early Anglo-Saxon period, so in the 7th, 8th century, um, whenever the, the kind of the dating for that hoard is, is finally sort of bottomed out when the publication comes out um, later on. Um, we could see that these, these types of sword fittings are being hoarded earlier on, but it doesn't seem to be any evidence for it happening later on. So we'd be tempted to infer from this, this evidence, from the poems and the biblical illustrations that we're looking at, that perhaps they're preserving an ancient remembered practice of hoarding these swords. Perhaps it's something that was done in the past, but that maybe wasn't done anymore. So that's why the discovery of the Beedale Hoard was quite interesting, because it shows us, it has this sort of first substantial real-life evidence that swords might, in fact, find their way into hoards in this later period. And it's, it's sort of helping to take us from poetry to reality, which is why I sort of called my, sword, uh, my, my talk that sort of rather nice title there. Now, the rarity of sword parts in these later hoards may not be so surprising if we think about it. This is an earlier sword... Uh, you can see it's in the British Museum from a site called Market Raisin with solid gold fittings and some garnets on the side. And this is one of these later swords. So we can see that earlier sword fittings might be made from, um, they might have fittings that are made from solid silver or gold, but later ones, their fittings are typically made from iron. And if they have any precious metal decorating them, it's, it's normally limited to something like sheet plating or these foil appliques that we're familiar with from Beedale or inlaid wire or wire wrapped around them, those sorts of things. And this kind of, uh, this sort of method of, of, of precious metal, having this precious metal is, is arguably less, um, less useful as bullion than the coins or the chunks of jewellery that, that typically populate hoards of this period. So the question then is how best to interpret the hoarding of sword parts at Beedale. And I think that the answer lies in that other sort of very interesting aspect of the fittings that I mentioned earlier, and that's the gold that adorns them. Now, several literary sources refer to golden-hilted swords during this period in later Anglo-Saxon England, and we usually find them in the hands of rather exclusive folk. So they're the armaments of, of kingly retinues. That's uh, something that Alfred the Great mentions in his translation of uh, Boethius' Consolation of Philosophy. We find the West Saxon kings, Athelwulf and Edred, uh, giving them either as gifts or as bequests in their wills. And the rather sort of sadly doomed elderman of uh, Essex, Burtnorth, um, who was uh, fought at the Battle of Morden in AD 991, was said to have gone into that battle carrying one of these golden-hilted swords, according to a poem that was written about the battle. 
But my favourite one is the old English poem uh, Maxims One, which quips that gold is fitting for a man's swords, to which I always want to answer, well, of course it is. Um, and any number of these references could be to fittings that are made with or, or decorated with um, solid gold. Uh, it could also refer to gilded um, sword fittings as well. But for now, let's, let's just give uh, the benefit of the doubt and assume that these, these references are to hilts that have um, solid gold elements or, or at least were perceived as having solid gold elements. So despite the apparent familiarity with golden hilted swords that, that is emerging from these texts, these weapons are actually almost entirely absent from the 10th to 11th century archaeological record. We only really find tiny bits of gold on swords from this, this later period. So here's an example of one, um, which is uh, one of these type L swords. Uh, and this is a lower guard, so it's, it's the part that's sort of next to the blade on, on the hilt. And you can see that it has these rather nice inlaid foils here, which are um, alternating between silver and gold, again using that truidal style decoration there. It was also said that a gold foil was found with the fantastic and massive um, sword from Abingdon, which is now on display in the Ashmolean Museum. Um, but uh, if, if that foil was indeed found, as is recorded with the sword when it was excavated, it's unfortunately now been lost, so it's not there anymore. So this seems to correlate with the established wisdom that, that gold metalwork was in general quite rare in the late Anglo-Saxon archaeological record. And this may be due partly to fewer material survivals in general after the period of furnished burial, which marks the early Anglo-Saxon period, went out of use in the later 7th century onwards. Um, we just have less material from the later period, so that would explain perhaps that there's less gold. But experts do tend to agree, or certain experts agree, um, in any case, that there probably was a move towards silver and copper alloy in metalwork during this period whereas gold seems to have, solid gold, seems to have been limited um, to making these rather small, portable, deluxe artefacts like these fingerings that you can see on this slide. Now, I should caveat all of this by saying that this picture might change, and indeed seems to be changing to some degree, as more gold artefacts from this period are being discovered by metal detectorists and are being recorded on the portable antiquities scheme and are going through the treasure process, that sort of thing. Um, so, for example, to take um, one instance, one type of artefact, gold ingots, which were previously quite rare, uh, now less rare, and uh, the, these increasing discoveries of these ingots are showing that this metal, gold, was actually circulating in similar formats to silver at this time. But crucially for our purposes today, I think we can still safely say that, that gold artefacts, and in particular gold decorated swords, do look as if they were particularly rare during this period. And indeed, a <clears throat> historian called Anne Williams, who was writing about golden hilted swords several years ago now, uh, concluded from those literary references that I mentioned about these golden hilted swords in the later period, she's wondering whether they might actually be referring to heirlooms from the earlier period, so quite old swords that are still being used sort of centuries later on um, in, in the later period, that these are sort of much older weapons rather than weapons that were made at the time. The Beedale fittings, therefore, very helpfully for us, demonstrate that actually these magnificent swords that are trimmed with gold decorations did actually exist in true life. I mean, we only have one of them so far that's, that sort of has the most extensive use of gold um, on it from this period that we know of to date. Um, and in the context of their, of their time, these sword fittings would have been exceptional and very valuable. And as such, that's why I think they may have been hoarded for the worth of their gold decorations. But I'd like to think about one of those aspects that really interests me about all of this, and that's what type of worth was this? What type of value was this? Take another quick drink. So let's first consider the most obvious form of worth, and that's economic worth, economic value. As I've mentioned, gold seems to have been rare at this period, which um, would have made it commercially valuable as bullion and would have been very highly desired. It would have been great to be able to get hold of a chunk of gold um, during this period. Now, the four gold grip mounts from the Beedale sword fittings each weigh several grams, and it seems like they're, they're quite chunky as well, so it seems like they probably would have been quite good, actually, as bullion. And there's a small hint, I think, that they may have been used as such. One of the mounts that you can see on the top left, this one here, is slightly larger than the other ones, 
and it has a quite a flat ledge-like edge, whereas the other ones are more rolled around their sides. They're much more like kind of proper rings, whereas this one has one edge that's, that's sort of flat. And I think that that was um, like that so that it would abut one of the guards of the sword. So that would have been at the top of the handle, perhaps, or the bottom, and would have sort of nestled against one of the guards, either at the top or the bottom, like that. And if I'm right about that, then I think there might have been a twin for that one. So there might have been a fifth one of these rings, another one that had one of these ledges that would have sat on the opposite end of the grip and abutted the other guards. So you would have had one of those at each end and the more rounded ones filling out the middle there. So perhaps once upon a time, the whole arrangement looked a little bit like this, with the greyed out one being the kind of potential twin for the other one. Now, five grip mounts is quite a lot for these swords, um, there's, there's usually much fewer than this, but interestingly there is a nearby precedent oops, from Gilling West, which I've already mentioned, which does have five grip mounts and is not quite so far away from Beedale itself. So if the Beedale sword did have five grip mounts, I'm wondering if it's possible that the fifth one, the potentially missing one, may have been used as bullion in a transaction of some kind. Now, the applied gold foils that we have on the rest of the fittings here, I think, are probably too tiny, too delicate, too thin and flimsy to have had much potential as bullion. Obviously, we can see that some of those foils are missing, but I think it's probably less likely that they were removed for some kind of exchange. They're, they're very firmly soldered down. I think they would have been quite difficult to remove without completely obliterating them, so it didn't really seem like there's that much point in doing that. Now, the little rivets, which I uh, showed a slide of earlier, uh, they could be the remains of extra foils that were maybe attached to the hand grip, as I've mentioned, and they would have been more easily removed. You could just prise out the rivets, perhaps, and, and take those extra foils away. And quite possibly, there may have been some extra rivets that, that, that did not make it into the hoard that may have been exchanged. They're slightly more, you know, they're still very small, but they're, you know, slightly more kind of accessible, possibly, as, as bullion. But overall, I think that the rest of the gold ornaments on, on the hilt fittings here are probably not really of sufficient size and, and and robustness to, to be of any kind of real commercial value. So I think we need instead to entertain the idea that the hilt fittings in the Beedale hoard were not necessarily hoarded primarily as bullion. So perhaps instead we should think a bit about their social worth. We've already seen from the literary um, sources that I've mentioned that gold-hilted swords are associated with the highest-ranking men in society, from Elderman Burt North at the Battle of Malden to the very kings of Wessex. So owning a gold-decorated weapon at the time when they were exceptionally rare would actually have made a very powerful statement about the owner, about who this person was, about his standing in society. And as such, having a weapon like this would have been something that you would, you know, you'd quite like to have. Another perhaps more sort of symbolic factor, uh, I think, may have increased the worth of this sword, and that's its visual individuality. Now, as I've mentioned, swords of this period might have similar shapes and forms. The handles might look quite similar in their outline. They might be decorated using similar styles, but few of them, if any of them, are identical. All of them are individuals. Now, it's possible, it becomes possible when you work on these weapons to recognize specific swords on sight instantly, quite a lot like you sort of recognize a human's face. You kind of go, oh, yes, that's the sword from Gilling West. Or, oh, yes, that's the Abingdon sword. You recognize it based on what it looks like outside. And I think that in the early medieval period, it, it may have been the same as this. There's a very interesting episode, again, from Beowulf, where we find a, a, a son reopening a feud with an enemy group and he recognises a sword, his father's sword, being worn at the hip of one of the enemy uh, that they have a sort of truce with. And just seeing the sight of this sword, his father's sword, which by rights he probably should have, should have received himself, being worn by the enemy, the person that, that killed his father, is powerful enough, this memory is powerful enough for him to actually reopen the feud and, and break the truce and everything kicks off again. So that's quite an interesting episode there. So I think that the Beedale sword uh, would have really stood out from the other weapons that were around at the time because it was shining with this bright, lustrous gold while they were kind of glinting with still rather nice silver or copper alloy, but it's not gold, is it? It's, it's not really gold. It also had these five, I'm going to say five, fat grip mounts on the handle there, while the other swords may have had none or maybe one or just two. 
And even its ornaments, as I've mentioned, if you get right down up close to it, has these little idiosyncrasies that sort of set it apart from some of the other more typical types of decoration on these weapons. So we can well start to imagine that a weapon like this may have become renowned amongst the people that encountered it, the people that sort of knew the person that owned it, it may have sort of acquired this, this reputation of its own. I'm going to add um, one more just consideration that, that gold as a material, irrespective of what object it adorns or, or which object it's, it's created, uh, this, this material itself may have had some kind of symbolic, powerful value. Recent studies of gold in the early medieval period have made arguments that this metal may have possessed some kind of potent symbolic or even magical dimension in certain contexts, uh, fueled perhaps by its rarity, its high value, and its incorruptibility. So gold as a metal doesn't corrode like, like copper alloy, like iron. Um, it doesn't tarnish like silver. It, it basically kind of stays this beautiful gold color as if it was made yesterday. So these sorts of properties made it sort of quite special, quite apart from its, its material material value as well. So if we combine these aspects of value, the economic, the social, the symbolic, we can start to see that the Beedale hilt fittings would have been extraordinarily desirable on multiple levels and as a unit rather than as simply for the little individual pieces of gold that are adorning them. Their destiny, I think, may still have been as commercial exchange, but not in the sense of this payment by weight system like the hack silver in the hoard where you kind of cut pieces up and you weigh them out and you, you find the right price and then you make your transaction. I think instead they may have been kind of offered perhaps as a purchase at a specific price that was far away and above what the little individual embellishments on it could fetch on their own. Now, whoever acquired these fittings may have been able to fit them onto a new blade and create for themselves an outstanding weapon whose splendor just would completely eclipse most weapons that were available at the time, I think. So for these reasons, I'd like to propose the hilt as sort of like a hack sword, perhaps the first one that we have from this later period uh, to date, and the first clear archaeological evidence that we have, joining those hints in art and literature that I referred to earlier, that special swords might find their way into hordes in Viking period Britain. Thank you very much.